Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Bestiary Codpast. For those of you who are not familiar with this, we're basically going to be looking at some comments and discussing some things about videos that I've produced as well as future videos. This one is going to be hopefully a little bit more on the shorter side with the comments and a little bit longer on the video discussion side. So let's see how we can get through it. The main focus I should mention of the video is the audio portion, so if you've got something to do or could tab away, please go ahead and do that. Unless of course you want to entertain your eyes with the fiddliness that goes on in the background. Please don't criticize me, I've just, <laughs> I just sort of started picking up this game. It's hardly uh, my forte. I played Symphony of the Night a while back and thought that it would be nice to kickstart this game and also share generally uh, my rather silly gameplay so do enjoy for our first section we're going to be taking a look at some of the comments that I've gotten alas there's been quite a few in the past six months that I have not been able to address and so they've built up rather rather a lot to be honest um, I won't be able to get through all of them I'll have I have chosen a few that uh, we'll be taking a look at and that I'll talk about a little bit, but for the most part, I am sorry if I haven't been able to get through with everybody's comments. I really do want to, but as, you know, as the channel's become more and more popular, it's been a little bit more difficult to keep track of things that people are saying. I, well, choosing comments, have uh, noticed that certain comment threads have just ballooned into these things that are way, way, way beyond my understanding. So, uh, I rather appreciate that, but <laughs> it's really difficult to keep track of all of this. Anyway, without further ado, uh, we have again Kirby March Barcina talking about the uh, Santa Claus video, asking that uh, if Santa Claus was not spelled incorrectly, and yes, I, I did spell it incorrectly, but uh, it was kind of a, 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 a silly situation that I was thinking about the movie Santa Claus, rather than the actual spelling of the character's name, the myth's name, so that was me being silly. He then goes on to mention that he does not believe wormholes would be a possible solution to Santa's traveling around because we would certainly detect it. And for the most part, I generally agree. It's, uh, it was quite difficult to figure out how to make it possible for Santa to move around, you know, as quickly as he does. He does mention uh, that uh, a few things about time travel as I discussed, specifically Time Cop, where uh, I think it was, uh, hang on, let me just read the comment, Jean-Claude Van Damme, yeah, where Jean-Claude Van Damme does uh, do a whole bunch of time traveling stuff. Uh, to be honest, I don't think that other movies, uh, or movies in general, do time travel really well, simply because they're all, you know, us guessing at the end of the day. I suppose, perhaps, maybe... What was that one with the the world coming to an end and then they they go to Jupiter? Um, okay, well that movie where they go to Jupiter because there's a wormhole there or something left by future humans for us to escape through. That that one is probably the best time travel film that I can think of. But for the most part, a lot of the stuff that we have, I don't really want to rely on, and nobody else should. Beyond that, it's kind of you know beyond beyond like simple basic understanding of how time works we really can't do much more than speculate uh, in Kirby's uh, comment he mentions that uh, in uh, Time Cop the bad guy sort of touches himself and then becomes a balloon monster I think he explodes something uh, either way in, in Time Cop the idea is that the object can't exist in the same physical space at the same time I think this was a misinterpretation of like time travel rules in that if I have like a block occupying a certain space I can't then sit back to a point in time where it is already occupying that space because then it's just gonna exist on and that might not be good whereas in time cop the bad guy touches himself he is actually a completely different physical object from the bad guy in the past like the the chemistry in his body is completely different and you know all that stuff so he's not the the logic that they offer in the film is not really consistent with what they're talking about and i think it was just a misinterpretation of the rules at the end of the day 
generally I don't think you'll end up with a time machine like situation the HG Wells time machine like situation where the machine itself is stationary uh, that might be a bit silly although if I recall in the the novel and the various films that have been done about it it does like disappear so although it's actually just going faster forward in time so it would disappear no would it uh like I guess what you would see is that everything inside the machine would be frozen if you were an outside observer everything inside the machine would be frozen and it wouldn't actually disappear just one day the person inside would sort of just come to it wouldn't vanish well uh, anyway this is this is what I'm saying time travel is a bit fiddly when you start to think about it and yeah basically it would be one of those uh, faster than light time travel or near luminal speeds time travel situations I guess anyway thank you for that Kobe moving on we have Praetorian Rex. You guys are really fond of making comments. There's, there's a very solid group here. Alas, I should say that uh, a lot of the newer commenters I haven't really much gotten to because these were these little bits and bobs were taken over throughout the months. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, Praetorian Rex asking about uh, the Jersey Devil that if we gave a goat wings and longer legs, would it be able to take flight and stand upright? I don't think so on either of those points. Standing upright is partially it's to do with the length of legs but also it's got to do with like hip and spinal structure so you would have to change it quite a lot and it would basically be like a fawn at that point. So probably I guess you could do it but hmm, it would take quite a bit of vivisection to get that right. Island of Dr. Moreau style and more H.G. Wells references, yay. Uh, as for the wings, generally I try to avoid making walking things, you know, land-based animals fly, simply because it's not just bones that are heavy, but organs and the overall design of the creature that prevents it from flying. Um, like, for example, the birds have, how could I say, like a very, very streamlined design to the torso. You know, expecting that they will be, you know, need to be in air, and they, they 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 have a limit to how much they can eat. Whereas if you look at things like uh, cows, you know, they've got these saggy bellies beneath them with a lot of uh, visceral fat. Whereas birds tend to be less fatty animals in general. I know chickens are a little bit more fatty, but chickens don't fly. I'm specifically referring here to the uh, the flying ones. Anyway, so it, it, it would be a lot of changes is my point, not just the bones. I do talk about bones in general as a general like go-to point because I imagine that that'll be the most common comment I receive uh, when regards to flying animals. But um, yeah, in this case, it's, uh, it's always good to remember that there's not just one thing or two things that you could do. There's, there's quite a few things that you need to change to make a land-based creature fly. On to Gradia Deer talking about the retrovirus video that I made, the spontaneous retrovirus video that I made, asking whether the creatures in a particular video uh, are possible, whether you can have an evolutionary chain like that. In this video he was talking specifically about the, uh, the, the, the chompy worm monsters in the recent King Kong films. These chompy worm monsters, whose names I've completely forgotten, are basically like they evolved from parasites, gut parasites, inside I think it was dinosaurs or some various monsters on that island. And through some process of evolution, they have become external and live in a sort of swampy area. And in general, I think that this is actually very plausible. It's not really outside the realm of possibility that a worm, a parasitic worm, could evolve into a more independent creature. It would be very difficult, but, you know, because one of the problems with evolution uh, in, in any regard is that once a creature finds an optimal range wherein it can survive, unless that range is somehow immediately destroyed, it's difficult to hop to another optimal range. There is a name for this theory and I will probably put it up on the screen right now but basically it's often visualized as uh, basically a plane with like 3d hills or 3d mounds for creatures to ascend once a creature has ascended a particular mound to get to a completely different mound it has to descend 
uh, this is obviously not something that the creature wants to do, uh, descending that is, and so it usually gets stuck in a certain evolutionary path. In the case of the parasite, I imagine it's a very similar situation, barring of course random mutations that might cause it to suddenly hop from one path to another, or make it viable for it to hop from one path to another. But generally, yeah, this is certainly possible. Next we have Demin Wielden talking about the Hippogriff and he's asking a little bit about how its uh, myth came about. Uh, this is obviously in reference to the Griffin video. Uh, he had only encountered it in the Harry Potter films and books and wondered a little bit more about them. The Hippogriffs, I was also quite surprised to discover, were not just a modern fantasy thing made up for modern fantasy stuff. I thought that they came about as a result of uh, tabletop role-playing games, especially as we had seen them in games like uh, Warcraft and you know other things like that with uh, computer-based stuff. On the whole, hippogriffs actually are quite uh, quite interesting, and I should say that for the most part, their reification and their myths and legends follow a similar path to the griffin. So I won't really be putting them very high on my list of things to do. But um, it's, it's interesting to see how a lot of the fantasy that we think is modern is nevertheless actually quite old. And uh, yeah, life is life, eh? And myths are myth. After that, we have Great Sire Kirby again talking about the retrovirus, uh, discussing in a little bit more detail as to how the retrovirus can alter cells and make various mythical creatures come about. And it's uh, is particularly with the creatures that I mentioned, such as uh, werewolves, vampires, and zombies. It he he does mention that uh, switching genes on and off inside the body does cause problems, and I think he rather well understands what it was that I was on about in the video, that we can alter genes within various animals, but it's difficult to say what those alterations will uh, result in and also how this plays out over time. If you want a really good book to read discussing all of this stuff, I highly recommend uh, Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, oh, I can just watch the film. And while the film is actually very good and, you know, a part of many of our childhoods, I recommend the book specifically because it's very, very, hmm. It's, it's almost the exact opposite of the film. Both film and novel are equally brilliant, I should say, and I recommend them in both regards, but you're learning a completely different set and the discussion is completely different regarding the topics presented in the book. And generally, I can say that Michael Crichton did a good job of explaining why altering DNA and why messing around with various little bits and bobs as we would is generally a bad idea especially since as I'm saying this we had that recent case of the Chinese geneticist uh, altering the DNA of those uh, I think it was a, a girl or something either way altering the DNA of a fetus we we don't know how DNA interacts with itself 100% that's kind of what we're trying to map out and the problem is, is that if you change one little thing or add one little thing that might cause a cascade of effects that are completely unpredictable. For this reason we mostly limit our genetic meddling to plants and then intentionally make it so that they you know can't reproduce. Of course this doesn't always go according to plan you know. Uh, genetically modified crops do often interbreed with natural crops and causes a lot of issues with various farmers and legal issues not to mention but um yeah it's uh getting back to my point uh, read jurassic park it's very 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 good for this and i think um if you want to understand natural living systems michael Crichton did do a book later on called um prey prey is a story about uh sort of nano machines that uh sort of we lose control of them and they don't go around you know consuming everything as we might think in a typical nano machine horror story you know in a gray goose scenario instead they begin behaving like animals and understanding how 
simple systems, like how simple rule sets can ultimately produce unpredictable behavior is the main story idea within Prey. So those two Michael Crichton books I highly recommend to anybody who's interested in any of these things. Also mostly, you know, it's fun to explore scientific ideas with a nice paint of science fiction novel. Next we have Christian Anderson saying that uh, he believes behemoths did exist once in the long last part of time. And you know, possibly they did. It depends on how you define behemoths, and in fact we could say this for most mythical creatures. Depending on how you define them, and depending on what you think the creature is, they very possibly do exist in the fossil record. We could say something like a uh, Diplodocus, or a Brontosaur, or what have you, is the exact equivalent of a uh, behemoth, or, you know, uh, we could have the ancient pterosaurs being the inspiration for Ziz, or etc, etc, etc. So, again, we're, we're, we're looking really at what is possible right now with the world and the environment and the food chain being what it is. So, that's I should say is one of the limiting factors for a lot of my videos that I'm also trying to think of now, not just in the long past. The long past does give us a chance to see what is physically possible on Earth, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that things are possible now. A good example to use is that of giant insects. During the Carboniferous period, we had a huge amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, meaning that insects with their silly, silly spiracles could grow to really large sizes, but these days with those sound bleh, with those same breathing apparatus, my tongue is tripping over itself, with those same breathing apparatus, they really are quite limited in size. So think of it like that. What was possible in the past is not necessarily possible now. Marcus Williams, talking about my Riverside stories, the Seed of the King, says that the king sounds like his uncle, to which I reply, my my poor boy, or poor man, or girl, or woman. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> the king was meant to be a sort of an allegory for arrogance and uh, all of those various negative emotions, so I'm sorry that you have to live with a person like that. But uh, you never know. Things might get better. He might get trapped by his own tree. After that, we have Hi Jekyll. Uh, speaking on the Beast Theory Werewolf video, saying that they can't stand when people say that scientists' word is law. And I generally don't like that kind of thinking either. In this case, Hyde Jekyll is trying to say that I often invoke what researchers and uh, various discovery people have laid out before us for us to learn about the natural world around us. And that if we take everything that they say at face value as the limits of what is possible, it tends to be quite limiting and frustrating. Again, I do agree with this uh, complaint, but at the end of the day, if we're going to be delving into speculative, bi nah. speculative biology, sorry my tongue once again, if we're going to be delving into all of these things, we need to have some kind of basis off of which to work, and you know, we could talk about various possibilities without any kind of grounding in reality until the cows come home, which is at about 7 p.m. as I discovered. But, you know, that's that's part of the fun and the challenge, trying to take what we know and then extend it to what might be possible. So I'm happy to entertain ideas of things that might or might not be possible, regardless of what other researchers and scientists have said. But that's that's just not as fun in my opinion i mean yeah we can uh, no actually no it it is fun because that's how you make fantasy that's how you make interesting stories and compelling narratives but for the purposes of these videos the challenge comes in trying to reconcile what we do know to be true or at least uh, okay let's speak philosophically accurately here what we do know to appear to be possible is what we are trying to reconcile the myths with. And I've said this on multiple occasions and I know that not everybody gets a chance to hear these things so I guess it just bears repeating. 
After that, we have Great Sir Kirby again talking about the Santa Claus video and specifically to my references of the Hogfather in that. Um, the Hogfather is actually a very interesting story. I generally like Terry Pratchett's writing. He's an interesting philosopher. I almost exclusively read his books for those those moments right at the end where he communicates something complicated and profound in such a simple manner. It really drives home how important stories are to communication in general. In this case, the reason why things are about blood is that Christmas as a tradition starts probably because of a midwinter feast where there's slaughter of animals to help you go through the remainder of the winter, uh, mainly because a lot of the plants and whatnot that you've eaten are, uh, you know, they've decayed and they've been consumed and there's not much more left. And there's possibilities of rituals to try and make the winter go away and uh, basically think of um, the theories around Stonehenge and the uh, related area, the wood, the wooden area, I can't remember what it's called where basically you have a whole bunch of people gathered together having a large party and they're slaughtering animals and this slaughter is the the idea the slaughter and the feast is kind of the origin concept of christmas and therefore sooner or later are about blood i'm doing a very poor job of explaining this idea but do give the novel a read it's it's very interesting it's very good i think there was a film made about it maybe i don't I can't vouch as to how good the film is, but maybe it will communicate the idea well enough. Next we have Kerry White's Strange World, uh, saying that if we hollowed out the lions and tiger bones of the griffin, for this is part of the griffin video, it would probably be able to fly and uh, fly without uh, and fly in a manner similar to what we find with prehistoric birds, etc. Uh, to which I say, yeah, probably, but again, my, my point with the uh, Jersey Devil comes back. It's not just the bones that we have to hollow out, it's large portions of the creature that we have to change. And while this is a lot of fun, talking about the speculative biology, it is, at the end of the day, speculation. And I don't have enough hours in the day to go over all the details, but I do like these ideas that a lot of you guys come up with, so please do continue. Gary White does go on to add about the witch that uh, there's multiple ways in which we could arrive at the same answer of moving energy around, saying that perhaps our current understanding of physics is just one interpretation and that there might be a whole bunch of others. To which I say, yes, again, I do agree with that point, but the most advanced and most effective theories that we have are the ones that we discuss in the video. So yeah, that's, that's kind of why I stuck to it. Again, my point isn't to argue what is possible and what is impossible, you know, full stop. It's it's to argue what is possible with what we currently know and what, at least, okay, not we currently know, what I currently know and I have access to. So that's uh, <laughs> that's the big limiting factor, my, my length and breadth of knowledge. So take everything I say with a pinch of salt. Not only that, just a hefty, hefty lump of salt. After that, we have Telchina Basilisk writing on the ghost video. If I were to make a top 10 video, what would it be about? I don't know. I'm not very much in the line of making top 10 videos. These things tend to be very sparse and not full of the detail that I like in the videos that I create. That said, however, there is a place for them, and I could probably see myself to making a top 10 video about, I don't know, odd creatures that have really, really niche roles within myth. For example, there's a lot of fairies that have one specific role within a lot of European folklore that doesn't often get discussed. I mean, we know about goblins, we know about uh, elves and all that, but, you know, there's like wood and rock nymphs that have strange and specific names and specific duties that just get glanced over and probably maybe a top 10 video about something like that or maybe a top 10 video that covers a lot of the creatures that I can't go into details about like the hippogriff or uh, maybe even something like uh, well goblins as I mentioned although on that note of goblins 
I have been getting a lot of requests to do goblins lately. And in fact, there's been one person who has made it his point in life to type on almost every other video, uh, in all caps, GOBLINS, and followed by a large amount of exclamation points, so maybe I should entertain him. But again, it is a fairy, so I've kind of covered them already. I'm not sure what else I could add. After that, another comment on the seed by Kirby March Balsina. Wow, it's just you guys that I seem to be... Uh, the small group of people who I seem to be finding a lot of comments by. I uh, saying, great story, he only wishes that I had more illustrations. Yes. Um, for these videos, for these stories, I was using a friend of mine, uh, Ricardo V, to create some of the illustrations. I didn't give him a lot of time to do them as well. I sort of just did these stories at the spur of the moment. So... Yeah, I didn't have much options when it came to illustrating them, but I will get more illustrations done for future story videos if the opportunity arises. Uh, right now, the artist is in England, so I don't think I can bother him right now for any of the story ideas that I have, but uh, hopefully I'll give him more time in the future to come up with something interesting. After that, Mark Torres and uh, Nicholas Lien Daja I, I think... Did you change your name, Nicholas? Because I, I, I do recognize you, but I can't remember if that was your alias before. Saying that uh, when I was talking about the possible form of Ziz, this is Mark Torres, uh, he was suddenly thinking of a hybrid mix of manta rays and squid tentacles, which in my mind basically is what, what came up to myself, but uh, I couldn't find any easy to create illustrations of a giant manta ray in space. So I just went the went with the jellyfish thing, because that was a more succinct description. And um, Nicholas, with uh, his comment uh, referring to the concept of atmospheric beasts, I recall a long time ago seeing a speculative biology series where they were looking at potential planets that had very dense atmospheres, and on these worlds there were actual like flying whales kind of thing. Yeah, so that, that's kind of what Ziz in my mind came out to be. I didn't want to create another giant bird, so ultimately I chose what I chose. And uh, my inspiration was the, those videos that I had seen before with the giant flying whales. So there you go. And over here we have Praetor and Rex asking if I could cover more movie creatures such as the Xenomorph and that he'd love to hear my thoughts on it. Actually, I think I will do this, because I imagine that there is quite a bit of demand for this, and I've already received several questions about doing things on aliens. Now, whilst I don't personally classify aliens in the realm of myth, they're more of a... Oh, how do I put it? Like, it's more of a... Uh, a statistical probability that has also had a lot of fiction created about it. You know, the, 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 the stuff so it's it's not quite the same but I will discuss it at some point I should say that anything that I talk about in the videos could basically be applied to aliens on faraway planets so there you go but I'll, I'll definitely do some more cinematic monsters after that we have the aptly named Pokesaurus saying that uh, Ziz has been shown in culture in the form of Pokemon. Uh, Rayquaza, 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 it's been a while, sorry, forgive me. Uh, I watched uh, Detective Pikachu the other day and I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many Pokemon that I don't know anymore. Why? Why has this happened? And living here in Japan, I get to see all of these strange new Pokemon that have been dreamt up and kids are messing around with and I just realized I'm so out of the loop with Pokemon these days but yes um, you are right Pokesaurus to be honest I could have done a bit more research into a lot of the more niche culture things and my memory for Pokemon failed me when considering the uh, you know the the this is creature so yeah um, though Nicholas uh, does go down to mention that this is based on something like uh, uh, the Rikaza is based on uh, Chinese dragons and Quetzalcoatl and all of those things. So, there you go. 
And finally, some more comments by Nicholas saying that the funny thing is that there is the uh, a titan in the Godzilla films called Behemoth, and there was another titan mentioned that was called Leviathan, but he doesn't know if there was one that was uh, one that was called Ziz, which I guess maybe there might be in the films, but it depends entirely on the creative direction that the film studio wants to go with that because at the end of the day you know it's it's their thing well, hopefully the wheel seizes I should mention that it was very tempting to try to get some footage of the uh, recent Godzilla film the Godzilla King of Monsters because that was whew, for Ziz that would have been amazing to use some of those shots alas as it is I made the film before any official DVD publication came out so it was not really in the cards for me to get uh, footage outside of uh, the trailers and whatnot. So yeah, it's uh, it's very very interesting. Anyway, with that, we're done with our comments and onto the videos that I've made. I'm going to try and get all of these done in a very short order because there were quite a few that I've yet to actually make any kind of decent comment on. So um, the last film, uh, not film, the last video that I made a uh, that I failed to comment on was the retrovirus vid. That one was very spur of the moment, and in fact, I it, it was made one day on a Thursday when I found myself with some extra time, and I thought, you know, let's just get on with it. And it has had not the best responses, I would say, but the most interesting responses. A lot of people enjoyed it, and I did subsequently, apropos of a lot of people pointing me towards other videos, find a lot more decent explanations than the one that I presented. I did try to go into a lot more detail with the actual mechanics of cell biology than most other people had, but, and I guess, well not but, but I guess for that reason I became a little bit discombobulated because it had been such a long time since I looked any of this up in my textbooks and I was basically just, you know, shooting from the hip as it were. But I do hope that it inspires a lot of you to actually look at these various things in more detail. Uh, so yeah. Please do, do go watch that video if you're listening to this. It was very fun to make and it was a nice change of pace considering I could sit in front of the camera for a change rather than, you know, flopping about behind a microphone the whole time and staring at a black screen. After that we had the Santa video, which it was interesting because I didn't want to use any typical explanation that we've had with uh, he's traveling faster than light or doing this and that that we've already heard. Well you know people really like fiddling with timings and schedules and whatnot to try and figure out how it works and I thought you know let's just let's just make him a time traveler let's just do all of this. It could just be like some old guy in the far distant future paying for his sins that would be very interesting you know it would be yeah actually that would be a fun story just to explore the the this, this strange Santa family that has to redeem themselves for something and so he has to fly around using his time machine and give presents to every single living child for you know the duration of their childhood and uh, yeah that'd be that'd be fun but uh, yeah for the most part it was a very straightforward video and quite short so I do hope that you guys enjoyed it after that we had the two Riverside stories uh, the titled the Riverside stuff is kind of apropos. Uh, I had some inspirations for that but nothing that I could decently explain, just that's how it came out. These two stories were born after, how to say, a little bit of thinking on my part and then one drunken morning, one hungover morning, having a chat with the artist whom I mentioned before and just applying all of the rules about storytelling that I had learned while doing research for the various videos and just, you know, shooting this out there. So I thought everybody would enjoy these stories and enjoy the attempt at subtle didactics as what we, uh, as what we find in um, older stories like Hansel and Gretel and that kind of thing. So yeah, if you guys want to see more stuff like that, I'm more than happy to make huge amount of them. I have quite a few ideas and I do have them on the back, born, at the back burner. See my tongue is just tripping over itself. I'm sorry those of you listening with headphones that have to listen to me basically uh, licking my microphone but 
Uh, there you go. Anyway, I do have a lot of these on the back burner. I have a few ideas that are milling about in my head and that I'm experimenting with. But at the end of the day, hopefully these will be something worth reading. The difficult one was the snake and the mouse because I couldn't decide whether it should be whether it should be fire or water that the mouse had to overcome with the snake because each of these have like different affective meanings and uh, it was it was a difficult story to decide on. I guess that's partly to you know that, that that partly shows just how unprepared I was for making these kinds of stories that I have to consciously think about it rather than just have a feeling for this right to do as a lot of the old stories tend to have so hmm, there you go finally we had the Ziz video Ziz was very difficult mostly because there's not a lot of information about Ziz this is probably the most sparse creature that I've ever done and I know that I often mention that creatures tend to be difficult when you're looking for information, but trying to aim for a 15 minute long video and falling short thereof by 5 minutes, which is kind of my acceptable range, I guess, is, and, and really stretching for that information, I should say, is quite, uh, hmm, quite disappointing and rather harrowing. So, ultimately with Ziz, I found that I had to use a lot of indirect sources like modern sources discussing things about Ziz because the original sources and original stories are just basically trying to complete the trinity of earth, water, air as I mentioned in the video and for that reason alone Ziz is not the easiest thing to do. Also for his reification I could have easily gone with another giant bird like creature as I did for uh, the griffin and I think there was one more that doesn't come to mind right now. But at the end of the day, I thought, no, 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 this would be cheating. I didn't want another repeat of what happened with the vampire and the zombie where I just said a uh, virus. Instead, I thought, how else could we make a giant creature that is above us? And I can't remember what it was. I think it must have been while well, messing about on Kerbal Space Program or something like that. I just thought, OK, let's let's put it in orbit. And then sort of the idea of the speculative biology video that I mentioned earlier came to the front of my mind and I thought, okay, wait, no, this is actually quite possible. One thing that I didn't mention was that the tentacles, the feeding filaments, the proboscis that uh, Ziz extends, would be undergoing a lot of strain. If Ziz is not in geosynchronous orbit, they'd basically be under a lot of tension, pulling them backwards, and like not not uh, not just like vertical tension but like actual torsion which I don't think uh, carbon nanofibers are really good at dealing with so they would be snapping left right and center so it's not really possible for Ziz to leave geosynchronous orbit if it wants to actually do any kind of decent feeding and it gets really really weird with the additional drag that the tentacles would then exert on Ziz lowering its orbit, so unless it had some kind of way of pushing itself back up into orbit, I'm not entirely sure like how it would work. Maybe if it could spurt some of the water that it had absorbed back towards Earth, it could probably raise its orbit again, but then you'd have this situation of basically a lot of the water on Earth collecting in orbit around the planet, which would not be very good. So, uh, it's... It's not an easy creature to reify. Even the idea that I presented at the end of the video was it has a lot of holes in it when you think about orbital mechanics and stuff like that. So, you know, if anybody wants to, I, I highly recommend please go into the details and see if you can make my original idea a little bit more feasible because it has a lot of holes in it. And um, finally, lip smacking aside, uh, future videos and future ideas. So. I think sitting here doing this video, I will probably do the goblin video as the next thing that I'm going to take on. I'm not entirely sure as to how I'm going to tackle it because, as I mentioned, goblins are fairies and I've already discussed fairies at length and how they would come about, but I guess if we were to go about maybe talking about them as some kind of like mm, reptilian thing that evolves eventually into a humanoid form. Maybe that would work. I'm probably gonna stick with that idea. Yeah, sorry if I spoiled the video for you here, but there you go. Maybe maybe I'll change it, but that's probably what it's gonna be at the end of the day. So yeah, um, 
Also, there's a lot of goblin stuff on the internet these days, apropos of that, uh, that, that anime that I keep hearing about. So, I might take a look at that anime and see what, uh, might use some clips from that. And there you go. That's, that's probably what I'm gonna aim for next. After that, I'm considering allowing the people on the Patreon account to do voiceover work for excerpts. So, if there's a passage from a particular book that I need read as a, again, as an excerpt, as you might see in some of the other videos that I've done, I might just offer to the Patreon people to do those readings. So, if you want to be part of that, you know, go to the Patreon account. I have to plug it at some point because I don't know what else I'm doing with it. I'm trying to make sure that everybody over there gets happy, but it was just, as I said, made uh, as a result of me being heavily suggested and even kind of forced into doing it. But it does give me mm, a kind of pressure to do videos more often. So if you want to add to that pressure and drive me to another grave, please go ahead and throw throw money at this, these, these projects that way. I will say that if I do get enough money through that, I do have plans to actually make like story videos around a lot of the creatures that I've done here. I have ideas for things about the unicorn and um, vampires and there was another one that I had thought of, I have it written down in my little notebook, that uh, if I get enough money I would definitely like to take a look at. But anyway, uh, I guess that's that for now. Thank you for listening and sorry for a lot of my lip smacking, it has been a while since I've done one of these. It is just life. Enjoy your bus trip, person who told me about the bus trips whose name I've forgotten presently because again it's been so blimming long and um, yes have fun guys see you in the next video